Chapter 15. China. Johnny had been unusually clingy lately. Ever since his meeting with Shane at the embassy, he was showing affection more publicly than before, sliding his arm around Emma, holding her hand, spending every aching hour of his free time with her in a way that brought up awkward memories of Jordan and Margot back in the fall. He still wouldn't kiss her in public, which was fine with her. Any moment they got with no one around, he would sweep her off her feet and make her feel like the girl in the Victory Day Times Square picture. She was still hesitant to initiate anything back, not for her sake, but his. His growing comfortability remained an enigma to Emma, so she let him take the reins when it came to all things physical. What she was able to do for him was dress in ways that made him smile. She had stolen one of his sweatshirts, clearly two sizes too large, and walked around proudly with a name other than her own plastered on the back. It was refreshing not to have to wear hers every so often. As thrilled as she was with this sudden change, the contents of his disappearing to the embassy made her uneasy. Johnny repeated over and over that they had found something relating to Jordan's mother in a separate location from where she disappeared, but every time stressed not to tell Jordan any good news, in case it eventually resulted in false hope. Emma knew Johnny had been growing close with Shane, and him revealing this to Johnny rather than to Jordan didn't seem too far out of the ordinary, but something still felt off. Too happy with how he was treating her in the aftermath, she decided not to dig any deeper. They went into their final full week doing daily exercises, testing the full length of their mission, with their training session Monday including three full hours where, having not been told in advance, they sat in the mission van doing absolutely nothing, but waiting for something to happen. Any time boredom would creep in, the squad would be alerted to something outside, preparing them to engage in the mission, before being put on hold again. Once the three hours were up, all seven of them, aggravated to the point of fury, were informed that their day was done, and that the whole thing had been a test of their alertness and patience. Xander constantly mentioned how rare it was that a squad get as much time as they had to prepare for a single event. Andrew's failed mission in Poland had been greenlit only at the beginning of the previous week, though his squad was designated experienced and highly effective, which was something Squad 3006 would have to prove in China if they wanted both the prestige of being dropped into quick missions and the benefit of then having most of the remaining semester off. Johnny still refused to speak to Jordan, though he was slowly opening back up with Margot. Emma had not expected the clicking of the group to affect her as much as it did, but in the days leading to their departure, it felt nice to be able to speak face-to-face -face with her best friend again, not having to feel like she was doing it behind her boyfriend's back. Despite his continued hostility toward an only living family, Johnny had made slow attempts at a friendship with Kent, appearing to forgive him for his repeated blaspheming while he continued to invite him to church every Sunday and Wednesday. He gave no explanation beyond, I'm just trying to be nice, which didn't explain his sudden urgency to be friends after months of not caring. If anything, his approaches made Kent even more hostile in return and his blatant disregard for Johnny anywhere but the training floor echoed Johnny's own attitude toward Jordan. The day before their flight out, the squad was granted the day off from classes, but their schedule remained overstuffed. Instead of heading to the school, the six started their morning at the city hospital, meeting Xander for the traditional last-minute medical checks. Emma stripped down to an uncomfortable level as a male doctor asked her a series of progressively more intimate questions about her nutritional habits, sleeping patterns, and then body, before checking every part of her for the most minute of issues, even writing down a hangnail cut from when she had nervously chewed one of her nails earlier in the week. After an hour of medical nonsense, her results came back completely normal, save for a recommendation to get more iron in her diet. This was nothing she didn't already know. Johnny was constantly commenting on how cold her hands were, and had already diagnosed her himself. The squad then followed Xander to an apartment downtown, known as the Preparation Salon. In order to appear as inconspicuous and ambiguous as possible during their mission, any distinguishing features of their physical selves were to be masked prior to their departure. For most of them, this meant nothing, just sitting boredly in the waiting area while the others finished. Liz, who had dyed a red streak in her hair alongside some friends for the upcoming winter play, was forced back to her natural full head of brown. Kent made a comment about her being back to normal, to which she threatened to sign him up for the tech team of the spring play if he didn't do it on his own. Most of the salon's work, however, was done on Jordan, bleaching his distinct multi-shaded hair and receiving bold blue-colored contacts to match the colors of his eyes. Margot worried they would color her silver nails and threaten her dexterity, was instead called in to learn how best to mask Jordan's eye scarring with makeup while they were on their own in China. After lunch, the squad had completed five separate partial run-throughs of the mission with separating variables. In one, the elevator failed to disable, so the group had to barricade themselves in the office alongside still conscious hostages. In another, double snipers from a neighboring embassy kept a heavy eye on the office window, requiring the necessitation of a firefight down the stairwell, led by Liz in one of the very few scenarios where she would need to confront the offensive. Emma stuck in the van a block away from the action, grew increasingly bored with how little she had to work with, though she reminded herself to be grateful her father had placed her so far out of harm's way. The final scenario of the afternoon was the only practical one in which Xander and she were in more danger than the others. In the simulation, the Chinese government had learned of their plot while in motion and swooped in to intercept the mission van, leading the others blind to a successful escape. The pair managed to fake their surrender escape flawlessly, 
though losing the van was a significant blow to the evacuation, and they were forced to improvise by hijacking a passing vehicle large enough to take them all, at which point Jordan had been nailed on the back of the shoulder by a recovering guard. With the sour taste in their mouths of the final practice on familiar soil, the four locals trudged through the snow and worked their way up to the mansion, where Emma's mother was preparing a goodbye roast on their behalf. While they would typically invite Liz and Kent to come along with them, Emma found it fair to have just this meal to themselves, just like old times, for the sake of putting them more at ease. Besides, it would be nice to have her father to distract the boys so she could finally have some time alone with Margot. Three enormous chuck roasts anticipated their arrival, the smell wafting through the entry hall and reminding Emma of days when she and Riley would run through the main floor, shooting each other with nerf guns. Andrew was always there too, of course, but he wasn't the one she missed more than anything. Her eldest brother's absence was noted as soon as they entered the kitchen. Where's Andrew? Margot voiced loudly, and Emma realized she hadn't noticed him at school that day either. In fact, she couldn't remember seeing him at all that week. Emma's mother looked awkwardly over at her father. Detox, he grumbled, trying to sound casual about but failing miserably. Brought him to Estes Park on Thursday. Emma stared around at her mother and father, then at her friends who seemed as perplexed as she felt. Detox, she hissed. For what? Her father kept his eyes on the plate he was loading with food. Drinking again, he said bluntly. Pretty much nonstop on the weekends. His bedroom's littered. Emma felt a pit drop in her stomach suddenly feeling terrible about her own collection behind their kitchen pipes. Andrew was usually good at hiding things from their parents. He was the one who had taught her. Her embarrassment came out as unsympathetic. And y'all didn't even tell me? Her mother shot her a look. We didn't want y'all to be distracted during your final week of training, she said. I'm sure he's fine. He'd wish you the best regardless. Jordan's voice found its way to the conversation. Still that bad, huh? They were approaching four months since the assassination attempt. He hasn't slept through the night in ages, her father continued. I don't even know if he can anymore without drowning himself. Odd words for someone who can't even drown, Emma thought. Emma's mother feigned a smile. Well, on that happy note, grab a plate. Let's eat. The couple sat on opposite sides of the table, with the boys flanking her father and the girls next to her mother. Johnny declined an invitation to lead the table prayer, so after her father was finished, the two halves of the table sectioned off in their own conversations. How are y'all feeling about tomorrow? Her mother asked. I'm so sick of hearing that question, Margot scoffed. It's not even funny. Emma's mother shot her a different look. Sorry for caring about your well-being, she chuckled, cutting into her roast. It's not that, Margot continued. It's just... She turned to Emma. You ever feel too prepared? Speak for yourself, Emma dissented. I think the more reps, the better. Like, I get we need the time to learn the language, she continued. But there is such thing as overkill, you know? She gave Emma another questioning glance before adding, I still don't get why you had to learn it too. It was a question Emma herself had not understood in the beginning either. In case something goes wrong, she explained, if we end up captured, it's best we play the non-American card as long as possible. Better to be overprepared than under, her mother chimed in. Does it scare you? Margot added. Being an outsider, I mean. Seeing your kids have to do all the stuff that you never did. Emma's mother took a sip of wine. I've had a lot of periods of questioning my why, she admitted but I look around and see all the blessings that this place has granted us. She gestured to the house around her. And I just consign it all to God's hands. Margot let out an audible laugh. Mrs. Guerin shot her another disapproving look. All right, Mrs. G, she added, almost mockingly. Clearly irritated, Mrs. Guerin turned to Emma and switched to Spanish. Don't let her speak for you, she commanded. How are you feeling? Emma shrugged, trying to appear as confident as possible. Fine, she claimed. More worried about the flights than anything, if I'm being honest. Her mother smiled. A blanket and lots of water, she urged. I've never been further than Quebec, Emma reminded her. Margot pounced on their conversation. Ha! <laughs> Quebec! I heard that! She shouted gleefully, earning the boys' brief attention. Just because you two can speak that doesn't mean I don't know when you're talking about me. Emma rolled her eyes. Now you know how we feel. Margot huffed. Whatever she then proceeded to call either Emma or her mother, they had no idea but it was bad enough to stop Johnny and Jordan mid-sentence. Whatever, she reverted back to English. I need more water. She rose from the table, leaving Emma with her mother to speak privately. They remained in Spanish as her mother gestured to Johnny. How are things between the two of you? Emma looked at Johnny, who was looking toward her father, then down at his hand on her knee, his most intimate form of affection. She felt herself blush, unable to hide it from her mother, who smiled back pridefully. Really good, Emma said honestly. I knew that boy was right from the beginning, her mother voiced. You always thought he was a little too odd, but I knew it. I've been praying about you. 
I hope you know that. I do, Mama, she conceded. You were right. Are you staying safe? Her mother went on. You're not giving in to anything you shouldn't be, are you? Emma blushed even more. Mama, I'm just holding you accountable. She held her hands up. It's a mother's job to remind you to follow God's path, not your own. Emma gave another look to Johnny's hand on her knee and smiled back to her mother. We are, Mama. I promise you. Good, her mother dismissed. I'm not so sure about these two. She gestured to Jordan in the empty chair beside him. You have no idea, Emma thought, before realizing, I guess I don't entirely either. The thought made her uneasy. She had no desire to know any more than she did. Uh, yeah, she managed. Me neither. Best we can do is pray they make the right decisions, her mother added as Margot rejoined the table. Miss me? She teased. Every day, Mrs. Guerin replied, switching back to English. Emma, dear, can you go grab the salt? I think I left it on the island. Emma stood to let the pair continue their years-long arguments, heading back into the heart of the kitchen to find the pair of porcelain shakers her father had brought back from one of his own previous trips to China. She turned back to the dining room, about to ask him what to expect on such a long flight, when she saw him continuing to talk to Jordan and Johnny. Johnny was glaring daggers into him. She cautiously made her way back to her seat, all the while watching her father continue to speak, oblivious to her boyfriend's continued forced silence. Thank you, hun, her mother spoke, taking the shakers from Emma's hands. She sat down and leaned over to Johnny. What's wrong? She whispered. Her reappearance caught him by surprise. What? He shot, turning quickly to find her closer than expected. Nothing. Emma furred her eyebrows. Well, tell me later then, she added. No. He paused, apparently realizing his attitude was visible for all to notice. Luckily, she seemed the only one to have done so. Really, it's fine. All right, she hesitated, adding, I love you. I love you too, he voiced kissing her on the cheek and turning back to her father with a blank expression. He clasped her hand in his as Emma turned her own attention back to her mother, who was again grinning with delight. She decided not to bring it up when they returned home. By that point, their attention was focused entirely on finishing their provisional and emergency packing ahead of their 7 a.m. departure time. When both she and Johnny had finished, they curled up in his room to watch some movie of his choice. But once they were settled and done praying together, she was out before the first line of dialogue. The next morning, his alarm woke the pair up before the sunrise. They separated to shower and change in their travel things before dragging their bags into the common room and grabbing a bite to eat. Liz came down shortly after Em had finished cooking her eggs, followed by Kent, who grabbed a bowl for his cereal with bags upon bags under his eyes. Johnny somewhat awkwardly grabbed Kent's own cereal box for him before adding, Feeling all right? Kent stopped and pierced him with a stare. Peachy, he growled. The hell kind of question is that? He then tore the box out of Johnny's hand and proceeded to the couch to eat there alone. Xander arrived at 6.30 to make sure they were all awake, threatening to drag Margot and Jordan out of their rooms just before the pair emerged, somewhat surprisingly from their own doors, showered, dressed, and ready to go. A car was waiting for them outside the residential center, a nice change from their usual freezing walk across the lawn or to the monorail station. With their bags crammed into the back, the vehicle drove them to the far northwestern edge of town, where a bright white helicopter was waiting for them on the tarmac of the heliport. Very few planes came in and out of what was typically an emergency runway though Emma had departed directly from town in her father's private jet on two separate occasions. Most days it was parked in Denver, and the family were ferried down via helicopter as the squad would be today, the usual order of things while on official business for the program. Emma was surprised she hadn't noticed earlier how similar the helicopter's interiors were to their missions van. They tucked their luggage into the netted compartments below their side seats, before buckling against the wall, just as they would be doing in Beijing. The noticeable difference was the noise. All seven of them threw on headsets to dull the sound of the blades, and though they had microphones with which to commune, it was too early for any of them to take advantage. An hour later, they touched down at Denver International, a fair distance separating their landing pad from the white peaks of the main terminal. Instead of a company vehicle, two airport security vehicles separated the squad in transit to the main departure entrance. Once through the doors, the magic of company privilege wore off, and they followed the masses into the main hall to be herded through the main security checkpoint. Kent's eyes lit up at the sight of the enormous ceiling. Never been to an airport before? Jordan teased. Once. Kent replied. On the way in. Emma had forgotten all about Kent's greenness to traveling, and somehow felt better about her own inexperience flying abroad. This was like a third home to her. She'd been through this airport more times than Houston. With Johnny's hand in her own as they walked through the line, she began to relax about the day ahead. Their first little bit of mission acting came when they hit the security booth, as trying to trick international flight records, none of them had brought their real IDs. Instead, they displayed fake Polish passports, christening their fake names. In the presence of authorities, Emma's next week would be spent under the alias Emilia Korczek, daughter of the Polish telecommunications director Andrzej Korczek. 
Still allowed to speak English while in the United States, she put on a slight accent and made her way through the censors. On the other side, the squad regrouped before setting off down the long concourse to the gate. There they left Sander with their unchecked baggage and separated, Emma and Johnny finding an easy breakfast at a nearby Auntie Anne's before settling back in the gate area. Chugging her lemonade after scarfing down her set of pretzel nuggets, she turned up her hood, put her head on Johnny's shoulder, and fell asleep. The first flight was easy. Doing the exact same tucked inside her sweatshirt and a blanket, Emma's only stretch of consciousness came halfway through the flight to relieve herself in the plane's lavatory. By the time they reached Los Angeles, she felt beyond rested, ready to go about their mission as soon as they stepped off the tarmac, before then realizing they still had another four-hour layover followed by a 15-hour flight to Beijing. Everyone else appeared to have the same attitude. Herding them through the far busier corridors of LAX, Xander guided the squad to a nearby pizzeria for lunch. Emma was more in the mood for one of many Asian options in the terminal, but realized she'd probably second-guess that thought after their week abroad. By four o'clock, all seven of them were desperate to get going, but their boarding was preceded by a mandatory passport check. Once again, Emma was forced to put on the accent and pretend she was coming from the mountains on a skiing excursion. On her way back to the seats, she noticed they were one of very few sets of passengers not of Chinese descent, and the reminder of her lack of foreign experience began to settle on her shoulders like a blanket. Kent looked like he was thinking the same thing. Outside of Liz and Xander, none of them had ever flown over the ocean, or on as enormous a plane as awaited them down the jet bridge. Liz clearly saw the nervousness on Kent's face, then turned to the others and recognized theirs. If it makes you feel any better, she said, out of earshot of any fellow passengers, this is the longest flight I've ever been on. Margot turned to Xander, her wavy ponytail still perfectly in place despite their hours of travel already. How about you? she asked. He grunted, clearly not excited either. Kenya, he muttered. At least this one's non-stop. They waited in line for what felt like half an hour before stepping out of the craft, Xander nodding to all of them giving permission to speak English more freely. Emma followed Johnny through one of the first-class sections and back to the standard cabin, where she found herself sighing with relief at the fact her seat was next to the aisle. She and Johnny situated in the two rightmost seats in the center block of four, while a silent pair of Chinese women packed in beside them, hardly acknowledging their existence. Beside them across the aisle were Kent and Liz, who were surrounded in front by Margot and Jordan, and to the rear by Xander, whose neighbor was a rather talkative businessman who spoke rapid Chinese, as though none of them would understand him or even care. Emma distracted herself by turning on a movie on the screen in front of her, the same one she had failed to appreciate with Johnny the night before. This kept her distracted long enough to realize they were taking off, at which point she paused the film and prayed that they would make it there safely. Two hours later, the film was finished, and finding herself bored and hungry, she hopped out of her seat and pulled down her blanket and a box of crackers, then paged through her phone until she started to feel bored again. What Emma had not accounted for was the perpetual sunshine. Flying in the same direction as the sun, the entire flight took place in its relative evening, with the sun sitting low in the sky but never even setting, even though her body clock told her it was nearing time for bed. While nighttime befell Tylersville, the flight crew were just beginning to pass out the evening meal of chicken and rice. She encouraged herself to stay awake. Looking around at the others, Liz, Xander, and Johnny were all reading, though Johnny kept passing glances over her at Kent, who was glued to his screen. Margo and Jordan were tucked toward the window, so she couldn't tell what they were doing to keep busy, but she doubted either of them were joining the book club. She decided to practice her Chinese, realizing with the surrounding conversations that not even every other word was intelligible to her in the various accents and dialects. Soon boring of this, Emma switched on another movie and used that to pass the time, but found herself continually less engaged than she had been with the first. By the end, however, she was finally feeling tired enough to try sleeping during the daylight, and curled up next to Johnny to fall asleep. The next few hours were absolutely dreadful. Feeling fine about sleeping through the sunshine, it was everyone else's insistence on not sleeping that was driving her mad. Light was one thing. Sound was another completely. Less than an hour into her attempt, the plane lights came back on and the flight crew announced yet another round of service, this time for beverages. Loudly making their way through the cabin, Emma was desperate for one of their shooter selections to knock her out, cursing the universe for the fact that she looked 12 years old before thinking suddenly of Andrew and feeling an immense pang of guilt. When they reached her seat, she settled for a water and a coke, downing the pair before bearing into Johnny again. Not having accounted for his need to eventually use the restroom, she was woken mid-slumber, and tried not to be angry for her boyfriend having a normal body cycle. He returned not long after, but it still took Emma nearly half an hour to get comfy and close her eyes again. Her own bladder pulled her awake an hour later, but this time she woke with a smile, realizing Johnny was fast asleep beside her, his hand still managing to hold onto her knee. She was pleased to find most of the plane had now fallen asleep as well, save for a Russian family gathered around the rear lavatories, chatting like it was an office cooler. After waiting ten aggravating minutes for them to take a turn, she realized they weren't waiting for the toilets, and she stormed into one of them to finally take hers. Back near their seats, Emma's anger worsened when she noticed Margot and Jordan huddled together under a single blanket, pretending to be asleep. At least Margot was. Emma knew her well enough to know she was still as a statue when she slept, but now her chest was rising and falling, 
clearly only having her eyes closed to ignore anyone as they walked past. Emma couldn't see their arms, but figured Jordan didn't keep his hand on her knee. Behind them, she was stopped in her tracks by another on sight. Liz, asleep now on Kent's shoulder, who was also out cold. Emma didn't know if this had happened consciously or by accident, but it was certainly not something she expected to see. Finally able to settle down, she once more put her shoulder on Johnny and passed out cold. Another half-day followed, but Emma managed to remain either sleeping or distracted until they touched down in Beijing. They shuffled off the plane with the rest of the masses, and found their way to the customs baggage claim, where all of their checked luggage seemed to be unharmed. Emma was prepared to put on the accent again before remembering where they were, and being shocked back to full attention by the lack of familiar signage anywhere around the terminal, she worriedly pulled out her fake passport and stumbled her way through the small conversation with the grumpy man at the booth. None of them seemed hindered by the Chinese, as all seven gathered once more on the other side of the gates and spotted a disguised chauffeur holding a sign reading Tyler in English. Xander passed the man his fake passport and the man nodded, escorting them out the main doors to a large black SUV similar to the ones they had in Tylersville. Inside the vehicle, the doors closed tight. Their guide dropped the guys and spoke to them in a near-perfect American English accent. Any issues? He turned to Xander beside him in front. None, their leader replied. Almost too easy. That's not necessarily a bad thing. He fixed his gaze to the rearview mirror. Tom Fong, nice to meet you. Exhausted from travel, the six of them grumbled a response. How long's the last one? Xander muttered. Four hours through the air, Tom answered to the audible groaning of everyone else in the vehicle. He smiled sympathetically. At least the worst bit is out of the way. Welcome to China. Like in Denver, the Chinese program had a private set of aircraft reserved on the outer edge of the airport. But to Emma's pleasant surprise, they were loaded into a private jet rather than a helicopter. She, along with apparently all the others, had expected to have to fly the distance in an open chopper. Instead, each of them found a thick leather seat with its own private selection of cold soft drinks and tucked in for another flight. In just a few hours, they touched down in the outskirts of Juliang. With the sun barely still above the horizon, there was enough light to illuminate the city. And for a brief moment, Emma thought they were back in Tylersville. Surrounding them on every side were rolling hills going on for miles in every direction, with mountains visible in the distance. Lacking the buttes and being roughly twice the size, Juliang was the largest of the program's hub cities. The city still looked shockingly similar, as if someone had taken Tylersville and changed the shape of the rooftops overnight. Stepping off the plane, Emma was shocked by a blast of freezing wind. Kent stumbled after her, feeling the same. Where are we? He muttered through chattered teeth. Emma blew into her icy hands before replying. Qinghai. It's in the west. Looks like Colorado, Margot noted, joining them on the tarmac. You're telling me you have to do that again on Monday? Jordan added, and an audible groan went through the squad, realizing their week of travel was far from over. Their moods improved when they drove through the city. At the center of town, very much like the lawn separating their facilities back home, a large circular park was fringed by the students' academy. A massive black triangle Emma recognized as their embassy, an enormous square building with color-changing panels on its exterior which Tom introduced as their training center, the Cube, and a bizarre horizontally-oriented Ferris wheel-shaped building, where the new vehicle finally came to a stop, the residential center. Tom led them through a covered courtyard, much larger than the atrium floor in Tylersville. Rather than a pool at its center, this one contained a weave of gardens zigzagging from edge to edge. He led them to an elevator, then up to the very top floor, where a long private corridor led them away from the main circle and into another round room, their temporary common room, a single floor surrounded on all sides by six bedrooms. Emma was quick to throw her stuff in one and hop in the shower, realizing midway through how desperately hungry she was. She ripped open one of her bags and pulled on a pair of leggings and an old Astros t-shirt, before making her way to the kitchen and praying the fridge was stocked. It was. Overslept, tired of sitting and full of too much energy to kill, she spent the rest of the evening cooking for every single member of the squad as they emerged fresh and reclothed. They ate in a circle on couches surrounding a massive stone table in the living room, before Xander handed them each a small white pill to take before trying to sleep again. It's an internal clock adjuster, he explained. Make sure you take it between 22 and 23 local time. You'll be out like a light for 10 hours. I'll come grab you tomorrow for training. He left them to head to his own private apartment, then all six turned to go their separate ways. Desperate to be finally done with the day, Emma snuck into Johnny's room, said her nightly prayers down the pill, and then passed out into dreamless sleep. Late the next morning, Xander returned to gather them for a long final day of preparations. At the cube, their last major physical alterations came in the form of two injections. The first, a bone-conducting communicator disguised like a cavity filling, which would replace their usual earpieces and be far less detectable through a security scanner. The second a digital location and vials tracker placed under the skin on the inside of their left elbows. The seven dressed in a rectangular locker room not unlike the one in Tylersville, before walking onto the perfectly reconstructed training floor to start a full afternoon of three complete mission runs of the training. As she had grown so accustomed, Emma followed Xander to the van parked at the floor's edge, and the pair practiced the entire journey from their hotel in Beijing to the Polish embassy alone, 
while the others ventured through a recreation of the town's subway system to make it there on foot. It was the most standard run they had ever faced. Everything in the final rehearsal went perfectly as designed, with zero variables thrown their way to change the course. Her father had assured her over and over that this mission was safe. She prayed everything would go exactly as it had done that afternoon. They were finished before dinner time, at which time Xander gave them full permission to head about the city on their own, so long as they were back in the common room by 2200 hours again that night. Still longing for time with Margot and Jordan the way things used to be, Johnny remained cold toward his brother, and avoiding the tension, the other couple went off on their own to find a local restaurant and test their Chinese. Instead, Johnny stayed adamant on including Kent and Liz in their plans. So to Emma's even greater annoyance, though Kent's was clearly even greater than hers, Liz dragged Kent along to join them on a four-person outing. To the south of the Central Circle, an open-air market held dozens of shops crowded with locals. Having dressed heavily for the weather, all were perturbed to see the others wearing light jackets, as an intricate set of plastic heat shields covered the plaza like a false ceiling, creating the illusion of warmer temperatures and causing Emma to sweat inside her winter coat. Trusting the company city was safe from theft, she was quick to claim a table and strip down to her leggings and turtleneck, then followed Johnny to a stir-fry stall. Challenging her palate, Emma noticed yak as a meat option on the menu, and confidently ordered in fluent Mandarin. Back at the table, Kent struggled to manage a set of pork dumplings with a pair of chopsticks, giving up after about three fumbles and switching to a wooden fork. Liz had found a stall operated by a man from India which sold kebabs, and was curious to see how they compared to her grandmother's back home. After voicing that thought aloud, her face turned somber. Johnny noticed and asked if she was all right, but Liz dismissed the concern and said she was fine. After they finished, the other two decided to head back to the common room. Emma hoped to take a romantic walk through the center circle with Johnny, only to find him clingier than she was skipping over the hand-holding to escort her through the park with his armor on her waist. They sat near a carp pond and watched the sun go down behind the academy. As the darkness triggered the lanterns along the pathway, Johnny leaned in and kissed her. Before she had a chance, he said it first. I love you. It was odd. The same three words she was so used to hearing in a situation similar to any other. Yet despite his steady voice, despite his calm demeanor, Emma couldn't help but hear desperation in them. I love you too, she recited staring up into his heavy green eyes. What's wrong? He shook his head, blinking, as if coming out of a trance. Nothing, he deflected. I, I just want you to know that. Of course I know that. Why wouldn't I know that? He turned his attention to the sinking sun. Nothing, he said again. I just... He turned his head toward the residential center. I don't want you to ever think I don't. Johnny, she started, but he held up a hand to stop her. That day in the training center, he recalled. When I broke your trust to trick Xander, I... I don't want you to ever feel like that again. Emma had a million responses. That day played through her head constantly. How could it not? The day that she had failed to protect her secret. The day she had almost destroyed everything her father built. And he had just swept everything under the rug and expected her to forget about it. You won't have to, she promised shakily. It's over now, and besides, it all turned out for the best, didn't it? Johnny managed a fake smile that looked more painful than anything. But what if it happens again? Emma eyed him sympathetically, placing her gloved hand on his face. You won't have to, she promised again, this time with complete certainty. I don't have any more secrets you need to cover for. We're done with that. Johnny's eyes returned to meet hers, and for the slightest moment, Emma thought she could read the look in them. What if they're not my secrets? Emma backed away cautiously. Why? She barked. What's going on? Nothing, he swiped quickly. Nothing, seriously. Th there's nothing going on. I, I just... He stopped himself, holding her hands in his to calm her down with him. He took a long breath. What if something does happen? He said slowly. What if I'm forced to do something I'm not proud of? Emma thought back to the day of their stress test, the look on Johnny's face as he gunned down one of the attackers with complete indifference. You won't, she promised, as much to herself as to him. I mean... She paused, thinking of the right thing to say. After a few seconds' pause, she swallowed hard. That's what this place does, isn't it? Johnny looked around. Uh, no, she corrected. Not here. I, I mean, the company in general. Look what it did to your family. Johnny's eyes darkened. Yeah, he managed. Look what it did to my brother. She paused, thinking about Andrew before adding... Uh, brothers. Both of them. Johnny sighed a second time. Yeah. And you know what? She grit. That's fine. That's just the way it is, and nothing you or I or anyone else we know, even my father is going to change that. The effects? We're stuck with them. Even if everyone 
we knew drop dead tomorrow. The effects would live on. So we just deal with them. We do as we're told, whatever. Johnny eyed her curiously, as though waiting for her to turn a corner in the conversation and finally find an upside. But I'm going to be here with you no matter what happens, okay? She switched. I don't care what happens. If you get trapped in a corner with no way out and you have to flip a switch, I don't care. You do whatever you need to do to stay alive, and whatever happens, I'm going to be here when it's over. It came out a lot sappier than she meant it to. But when she put her hands back in his and looked back to his face, she could see tears fighting to escape his eyes. Wow. Was I really that good? She wondered awkwardly. Johnny cut off her train of thought. What if I can't switch it back? He asked. What if I don't come back the same? Emma shrugged. Then we'll deal with that when it's over, she reassured. The most important thing for either of us is surviving. We do what needs to get done and survive. She smiled. Think we can both manage that? Johnny pulled off his glove, exposing it to the freezing air. He held up a single pinky. Wordlessly, Emma pulled hers off too, wringing her finger around his as tight as she could manage. Enough of that, she said after a moment passed. <laughs> We've got three more hours before we have to be responsible again. How do you want to spend it? She smiled as playfully as she could, trying to revive his energy, but Johnny remained deflated. I don't care, he whispered, pulling her into a soft hug. I just want to spend it with you. After lunch the next day, the squad reboarded the private plane and returned to Beijing. Smog hung over the city, blinding their view of any landmarks as they took a cab from the airport down to the heart of the capital. Johnny's hand remained tight in hers, silent as they listened to Xander make conversation with the driver. English was out of the question now. The last words they could speak to each other before the mission had fallen out of their mouths as they exited the plane. The others sat silent too, observing their leader make slow references to the small town outside of Warsaw which he claimed to live. His face was stoic. Emma could sense his own last-minute anxiety creeping below the facade. Their phones, clothes, and personal items remained back in Juliang, now replaced by fake copies of the originals hinting at European origin. The photos in Amelia's phone were all doctored, uncanny recreations of an artificial life Emma had never known, complete with fake friends, fake siblings, and fake parents. A picture of an unnamed dog sat behind her student ID card in her wallet. She decided to name him Turbo. The longer they could stay silent, the better they were instructed. Though as they neared the halfway point in their journey, the cab driver must have spoken the trigger phrase. Xander poked his head up in the rearview mirror and barked in loud Polish. Speak! Sorry, came a few of their voices, now in Chinese. Long flight, Johnny said. Well, welcome to Beijing, the driver replied. We're glad you're here safely. Xander began explaining their situation as students and instructor returning from a vacation in the United States. I see, the driver corrected. Welcome back, then. Ten minutes later, across from a large stadium, the cab pulled into the loading lane of their hotel, and the driver handed each their fake bag. The reality of their situation hit Emma hard with the ominous appearance of their white missions van, parked among a handful of vehicles in the neighboring lot. The time had finally come. Xander did the talking and checked them in, walking them down the hall to their opposite rooms, then handing a single card to the boys and a single card to the girls. You know the rules, he said, switching back to Polish. Room service only. Do not leave your rooms until I get you in the morning. He turned to Margot and Jordan foremost. I mean it. The pair looked at each other and nodded. Mission starts now, he added. No English louder than a whisper. Say your goodbyes for the night. Good night, Margot started, leaning up to kiss Jordan before hugging Johnny and Kent. Liz made her rounds in turn, giving each of the boys a hard squeeze. Emma looked at Johnny, whose heavy expression had only hardened since the previous night. I'll see you in the morning, she assured him adding one last I love you before a kiss for good measure. Then she hugged Jordan, Xander, and Kent, the latter of whom seemed unsure how to take it. Margot took their key and opened the door to the room. Jordan did the same across the hall. With one last look over her shoulder, Emma nodded to Johnny, and the doors closed to block her view. <laughs>